and some data around some drug repurposing approaches for, for COVID-19. And, and really, I, I guess we've probably seen a lot of um, publications and, and online articles and so forth with repositioning, um, but, but I, I address this from a sort of maximum likelihood perspective. So what's the most likely um, drug that will be repositioned for, um, uh, for COVID-19 infe infection based on uh, a statistical analysis of the underlying um, uh, sort of history of drug discovery in the antiviral area. So drug repurposing is clearly a really interesting thing, very close to the patient. A um, couple of my um, sort of favorite examples are on on this next slide, and, and serendipity is often involved, and, and the sort of indications or diseases that are discovered through um, the, the sort of experimental repositioning um, are often quite common in the underlying population, and, and that makes sense as well. In order to find 30% of people have their baldness cured, you, you need to have a reasonable number of bald people in a, uh, in a trial. And, and the other interesting feature of this approach is again maybe because there are their serendipitous discoveries they're often these repositioning these, these drug repositioning events are often first in class innovative medicines so minoxidil was the first um, reposition drug that uh, I came across I was working at up John at the time uh, that uh, uh, it was all discovered minoxidil was a, an antihypertensive um, one of the interesting observations post-approval was that compliance was pretty low, uh, in particular with females, um, and also um, there was this trend to have, um, you know, or to grow facial hair that wasn't there, uh, wasn't there before. Uh, and of course, it didn't take long to think about repurposing minoxidil as uh, an anti-baldness drug initially in, in, in males, um, and then as a hair growth um, uh, agent for, uh, for females. The, the, the classic that everyone knows is, is sildenafil. Uh, this was a, a particular class of antihypertensive and in phase two, erectogenic side effects were observed in trials. Um, and actually this was the first approved indication for uh, uh, sildenafil or Viagra as it became known. Um, and it was then later launched as a, a treatment for this rare but incredibly serious pulmonary arterial hypertension, PAH uh, indication. Uh, another example, um, an unusual uh, disease, uh, again, uh, was flibanserin. Um, this was an antidepressant, um, quite an old drug, been around the block in terms of trials and profiling. Um, one of the side effects of antidepressants is often loss of libido. And so they were scoring this on the, on the patient response cards, and they actually saw a pro-libido effect, uh, side effect in the trials, which was quite unexpected. And this actually uh, led to the first approved indication of the drug um, uh, for, for low libido in, um, uh, in females. Um, it's really interesting um, to go and look at the, the, um, uh, the prescribing information for that drug. Um, it, it's got some absolutely horrendous, um, uh, well, or quite complex, uh, horrendous isn't quite the word, uh, quite complex um, drug food uh, interactions. The, another example, bimatoprost, as the name uh, suggests, it's a prostaglandin um, uh, lookalike compound originally approved for ocular hypertension. Um, and uh, after use, it was soon discovered that it was pretty good at encouraging the growth of thick, uh, more luscious eyelashes. Um, and so um, this, this repositioning or reuse uh, in a commercially valuable um, uh, setting uh, became um, uh, you know, be became approved. The talking about the prescribing information. Um, so this is the prescribing information for the same drug, but uh, bimatoprost in um, exactly the same dosage form. Um, you know, an ophthalmic solution, um, and you can see here the Lumigan product is for the treatment of glaucoma. Um, the original indication, uh, Latisse, is the trade name of the uh, the more cosmetic um, indication in this case, and the indications and usage and the warnings and precautions for the drug have li literally swapped over in both um, uh, in both cases. Um, uh, but, you know, again, a really nice historical example of drug repositioning. Another brilliant um, uh, sort of case story is thalidomide. 
um, originally approved in the 1960s with with relative well with with lacking um, uh, efficacy and uh, in particular safety data uh, it turned out to, of course to be a very par powerful teratogen but subsequently has been um, repurposed or, or you know and commercially very successful in multiple myeloma um, and also in um, uh, as a primary treatment for uh, the very serious disease uh, leprosy so plenty of opportunities to take existing drugs find new indications of them um, and uh, uh, potentially a lot of science and in particular data science in finding and revealing those uh, those new indications the repurposing literature is is huge yeah if, if you go to pubmed and type in drug repurposing, you, you'll find thousands, tens of thousands maybe of, uh, of publications. Um, but the, the literature itself, in my view, can be quite deceptive with respect to, first of all, the, uh, the basic principles, but also some of the representation of the, the underlying science. So on the, on the left here, we've got a recent publication on the use of aranafin um, as a uh, uh, as a potential um, agent for an antimicrobial resistance in these so-called escape pathogens. Um, as the name suggests, aranafin is, is a gold-containing drug, um, so not typically the sort of thing you'll find in your, um, in your, in your compound collections. Um, and uh, in the paper, of course, they, they screened and found this, um, and on, on one of the first paragraphs, its safety has been well documented with no reported concerns in terms of carcinogenicity carcinogenicity, serious side effects, or other long-term safety issues. Um, the prescribing information, so the legally required document um, in, in the States for an FDA-approved drug that describes the drug properties, its usage, um, uh, and you know, all, the, all the safety compliance data that you would, uh, uh, you would ever want. This statement here is in very sharp contrast to um, uh, what uh, uh, the black boxed warning says so so drugs with an inbuilt safety issue have a boxed warning at the top of their um, top of their prescribing information hence the the term black box um, the uh, so it's a pretty serious list of side effects uh, you've got to do laboratory work prior to writing each prescription um, you know, this drug is only indication for selected patients with active RA um, Physicians planning to use the drug should be experienced with chrysotherapy, uh, and chrysotherapy is, is the use of gold in medicine, and should thoroughly familiarize themselves with the toxicity and benefits of Redora. This is no normal, well-tolerated um, well tolerated drug. And the other really interesting thing is um, effectively this, uh, com this gold complex is, is actually a prodrug of um, uh, colloidal gold. So one of the first things that happens when you dose this is that the, the gold um, crashes out probably as nanoparticles of some form. I, I, should have, I should have looked it up. But the drug itself has never been detected in the blood. Um, and so even if it's active in, a, um, in, a, in a, uh, uh, an in vitro system, the very fact that the drug is rapidly transformed into something else that may or may not be active is, is quite telling. And the lots of drug repurposing papers, um, you know, need to be read with some caution. Um, referring to the prescribing information is always good practice. Um, think about the dosing, think about the safety, um, think about the dose levels as well. In, in in vitro response at 10 micromolar, you know, it's going to be incredibly difficult to get in a uh, in a clinical uh, clinical setting. The other thing, of course, is, is what drugs can you reposition? Um, so to reposition a drug formally, I guess, uh, the drug needs to be approved. And there's about 1,500 to 2,000 chemically distinct drugs worldwide. Uh, people will debate those numbers, but, but it's in that, um, in that sort of order. Um, and there's about another two or 3,000 drugs, candidate drugs, that have got to phase three trials historically. And they may, may either still be in study, um, Others might have stopped for commercial reasons. Um, others might have failed for efficacy, so they didn't work in the original indication. And others might have uh, failed because of reasonably late stage safety issues in the, the original patient group. 
But the nice thing about these late stage drugs, phase three, is that you can assume that bulk supply of the of clinical grade drug is, is um, probably available for study and it probably doubles the pool of drugs that you can, you can consider. So 1,500, 2,000 approved drugs. However, there's a lot of drugs that are biologicals, monoclonal antibodies, recombinant enzymes, replacement enzymes, and so forth, solubilized receptors. There's now cell and gene therapies. There's interference RNA. Uh, in the States, sunscreens are listed as, um, uh, sunscreen um, ingredients are listed as, as approved drugs because of the way the regulation works. Um, a reasonable number of drugs are radio imaging agent, uh, radio, radio imaging agents, and again, not all of those will be worth considering for, for repositioning. Um, it's a, a real uphill battle um, to think about uh, repositioning anything in this, um, in this sort of class, probably. Um, but again, from, from my reading of the literature, one of, one of the, the issues that um, is, is often neglected in computational studies are prodrugs. So about 10% of all approved small molecule drugs are actually inactive in the dosed form and require some biotransformation in the body. The treatment of racemates, especially in 3D or docking-based studies, some drugs are dosed um, as a mixture of two components. So, so a nice example is modafinil. Um, there's also the, the stereochemically pure or stereochemically active form, armodafinil, um, uh, where, the, where the stereochemistry is, of course, defined in the, the R and antimer. Um, but, but again, just keeping on top of racemates when you switch to 3D methods is, is you know, complicated. Similarly with tautomers, um, uh, ionization states and so forth, a lot of drugs have um, soft P PKAs or PKBs. So um, a, a PKA or PKB around seven or eight, um, you, know, you need to think or consider explicitly sometimes the form you're actually docking into the, uh, into the, uh, into the receptor, for example. Uh, and also covalent binders. So these you know, are probably you know, non-trivial um, uh, uh, drugs to think about repositioning or think about computational studies on, and, and the application of additional prior knowledge is, is clearly, um, clearly important. The second thing, for, uh, the second thing to, to really consider when conducting a, um, a repositioning trial is, is the product profile. So what does, the, what does the drug need to look like? Is it gonna be dosed or is it best dosed orally? injected, topically inhaled. Um, if the drug is used in um, patients already on existing therapies, are there any uh, significant drug-drug interactions that you need to be aware of? So anything that's a, a, a P450 um, uh, 3A4 inhibitor uh, or, or a PXR um, agonist, you know, immediately starts to think about, you know, interactions with other therapies that a, a patient may be on. Um, Differentiation from current therapies, clearly finding a small molecule to replace an orally active small molecule to replace an expensive monoclonal antibody has got great value for patients. Um, dosing frequency, the PKA uh, or the PK properties, pharmacokinetic properties, half-life uh, in particular, are really important to thinking about whether a drug will be realistically repositioned. Cost of goods, um, risk of, of controlled substances, um, uh, tolerable side effects, uh, you know, use in breastfeeding populations, um, pediatric and, and geriatric patients as well, um, and, and anything that requires specialist monitoring, liver function tests and so forth. Again, you, you're just literally not going to get into a, a broad patient base um, with, uh, uh, with, with good compliance and safety. Fundamentally, a lot of repositioning is a lot of computational repositioning is just futzing around with this drug target disease relationship. So here's a drug, celecoxib. It's a COX-2 inhibitor, also inhibits COX-1 pretty well. Um, uh, and it was, uh, and it's used uh, clinically for rheumatoid arthritis. And soon after its um, development, um, uh, and well, really during its clinical development, a large number of other indications were, uh, were, were approved. Uh, were studied and it's led to over time the addition of additional diseases that are very distinct from the original indication and as a manufacturer or a developer of a drug you know this is clearly both patient-wise 
a great thing to do because you treat a larger number of patients with the same drug, but also commercially valuable as well. You can reuse the same safety and dosing data and so forth. So in this case, um, a drug for rheumatoid arthritis, xenococcib, is also used for uh, this um, uh, sort of pro-cancerous condition, um, FAP, uh, which is in a completely different area of sort of the way that, that we describe medicine, this um, classification of this ICD um, classification system. And one of the other nice features to look for is where a drug is, is relatively deeply embedded away from the target or the, or the mechanism that produces the, 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 the terminal pharmacology. So uh, a COX-2 inhibitor is quite deep in this cascade of um, uh, prostaglandin-like molecule signaling and through various branches, pain, inflammation, platelets, um, stomach kidney function, um, artery vein function, uh, tissue healing and, and so forth. And so over time, uh, celecoxib, due to this sort of pluripotent um, uh, sort of pharmacology, has been used in oste osteo and rheumatoid arthritis, um, ankylosing spondylitis, um, I, I know I've said that wrong, uh, pain, dysmenorrhea, FAP, uh, and so forth. And again, another drug with great um, multi-uses is um, uh, a very similar or analogous um, uh, situation to this is uh, the statins, which again inhibit the production of a large number of, of signaling metabolites very deep or down or, or at the early stage of a, um, a, of a metabolic pathway. So a, a really nice paper, one, one of my favorite papers from um, 2019 was uh, an analysis of the, um, the success or relative class of drug repositioning across a, a fairly extensive, um, fairly extensive data set. The, the numbers, and, and the examples used don't quite agree with what I would have published, but they published and, and the numbers are pretty good, to, to be honest, well, better than mine, I would, I would guess. Um, I just wish I published it first. Um, but anyway, you could either reposition a drug through the same target for different diseases. So here you're relying on looking at disease similarity and about 60% of repositioning Historically successful repositioning has been exactly this. The same drug, the same target, different diseases. About a third has been um, where you have a relationship between similar targets um, projecting onto a, um, a sort of different disease uh, or the same disease. In a, or a, yeah, we'll come on to that in a second. Um, so 60% you're, you're playing around with disease similarity. About a third of the time you're playing around with target similarity uh, and the cases where that they classified as being drug um, similarity observations are about one in 20 um, historical cases of, uh, uh, of drug repositioning. So it's a really, really nice paper. And, and cutting to the chase around, um, around uh, COVID, dexamethasone for me is, is in this 60% class. Remdesivir is in this... Um, uh, this class where you're, you're relying on target similarity to actually do the, um, uh, to do the repositioning. A subtlety on this target relationship class or, or this ortholog, paralog, non-related repositioning is, is in the following slide. So where you're looking at a simple ortholog, so the, the relatively trivial case of taking a human drug and uh, repositioning it in, say, a veterinary disease in, in a dog. Um, you know, that, that's low down in terms of the complexity. It's clearly most likely to happen. It's not a done deal, though. There's loads of drugs that have, you know, quite radically different safety and tolerability in, in closely related species. Um, but with respect to the target mechanism, it's a pretty safe bet. And computationally, this is, this is low cost. Um, the, the intermediate case, um, is where you're dealing with a paralog. So this is a related target, but it does a different function. So we know the active site's likely to be the same, or the, or the, the primary uh, ligand binding sites, the same or similar, um, but they signal through to different um, disease endpoints. Um, this is quite likely. Um, so COX-1, COX-2 would be a nice example of this 
uh, from the past where COX-1 inhibitors are certainly active against COX-2, and this led to the development of more selective agents. Um, takes more compute time to, um, uh, to sort of uh, do this. You, you've typically got to consider a larger number of paralogs. Um, ranking on the basis of, of uh, selectivity is still quite a, a challenging task in, in my view, uh, in particular around um, clinically relevant concentrations. Um, and then on the right-hand end, where you have unrelated targets, so, so one of the examples uh, from the Parisi paper is um, a drug that binds to the ribosome and also to NMP3. So two very, very different, completely unrelated um, protein targets. That's inherently more unlikely, um, but also is going to be a lot more expensive computationally, irregardless of the particular computational approach that you, you follow against it. So the low-hanging fruit is on the left-hand side. The tough stuff is, is on the right-hand side. And of course, as scientists, we love difficult stuff and we love solving uh, difficult problems. Um, and, but as pragmatists, it's sometimes easier to work on the, the, the simple and obvious stuff. And, and I was running through the slides in, in bed this morning and I, I wanted to get across this, this ortholog and paralog um, sort of uh, concept so to do with the target relatedness on this diagram. And I, I came up with this and my wife said, that's the worst possible simile of orthologs and paralogs you, you could possibly do, but I'll do it anyway. So an ortholog has got the same function. So two different strains or varieties of apples. Um, they do the same thing in recipes. They, they, they have the same function, really. You can interchange them. Um, they're clearly related and incredibly similar. A similar function would be a pear and an apple. You know, it's related. You know, if you cut them in half, you'd see some similarity um, in their, their function. You can probably make a pear tart as well as a, an apple tart or, or, or something um, if you wanted to. And then building on this analogy of if you can't compare apples with oranges, a completely different function would be an apple and an orange. Um, but, but of course, this is crazy because you can compare apples and oranges now using molecular techniques and and so forth. But, but the idea is to, to get across this class membership as being a privileged function or a privileged, privileged relationship with respect to drug repositioning. And a really nice historically repositioned um, antiviral drug is um, uh, acyclovir. And uh, so now generic, um, cheapest chips, uh, and it's if it, it's to all intents and purposes active against every um, clinically significant human herpes virus. So HSV1 for, for cold sores, HSV2 for genital uh, legions, VZV, chickenpox, Epstein var virus, HCMV. So this is a really clear example of this ortholog based repositioning. Same drug, just using it against the same target in different species. And I, I realize I've just seen that I've, I've spelt viral wrong there. But the other interesting thing, going back to this, um, this computational um, gotchas sort of approach, is that this actually is, is quite a nasty prodrug. So it, it's, it's got no activity um, or, or no antiviral activity in the dosed form. And it requires loading up with three triphosphates um, in order to become active. So the, the terminal OH in, in the center of the screen there approximately requires essentially converting into an ATP uh, and adenosine triphosphate um, mimic um, in order to become active. Um, and, and the other really interesting thing for this particular example is the first step of that loading up is done by a virally encoded uh, nucleotide kinase, thymidine kinase, which all of these viruses uh, reasonably uniquely um, uh, contain. So the, the virus contains its own part of its own activation mechanism. So a broad background, um, a, a little bit of, of introduction to repositioning, the um, introduction of some sort of core concepts around set membership, target similarity relationships, and likelihood, and so forth. So, so now let's look at um, COVID-19. You know, it, it's clear that the progression of, of COVID-19 um, into a severe dis disease state really is, is initiated by the viral infection. 
and then it progresses through to, depending on the host inflammatory response, to, to a, a far more serious condition. This is the thing that will um, uh, kill you. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of inflammatory and, and coagulation sort of things that are derivative of the, the infection, but you, you really do see this difference between a viral response and then a host inflammatory response. Um, to a good approximation, as we'll come on to later, um, if you want to treat early in disease, where the vast majority of patient numbers will be, um, you need to look for viral directed therapies, uh, things like remdesivir. Um, if you're in the host uh, uh, sort of inflammatory or aberrant um, inflammatory response stage, you really want to think about directing drugs against um, the host. Um, so dexamethasone, again, is a really nice example of this. Dexamethasone, as far as I know, doesn't do anything um, against the viral um, process. It's primarily um, stopping the overstimulation of the, uh, of the immune system. Um, and of course, as you go through this disease progression, you, you go from the opportunity of treating patients in a community setting, so at home um, or in an outpatient's clinic, versus quite a serious hospitalized um, uh, you know, patient group where differences in, in, in the, the ability to dose drugs is, is very apparent. So doing, uh, going back to this product profile, if you're after a community-based therapy, yeah, um, uh, doing an infusion, an intravenous infusion, it is effectively impossible. You, you, know, you can only really deliver that in a managed um, secondary healthcare um, setting. Uh, and that's one of the issues with, uh, with remdesivir. So th there's clearly been, since the discovery of the virus, its sequencing and classification as a sort of subtype or, or, or sister species of, of the original SARS, you know, lots of people thinking really carefully and, and, and in a very intense way for the development of novel therapies. Um, the largest impact is, you know, hands down, is likely to come from a successful vaccine, as has been done for loads of viruses. So, th so things like smallpox, measles, um, and so forth, just their impact on, on human health is transformed by you know, relatively simple one-time um, vaccination, or ideally one-time uh, vaccination. But that simply isn't possible for all viruses. And the jury's out a little bit, with, in, in my reading, not that I'm a virologist or an immunologist at all, uh, the jury's out as to whether there will be, um, you know, the, uh, the ability to have a long lasting um, single shot um, uh, vaccine against um, the virus. But in terms of population health, the biggest thing has got to be prevention. Once you prevent it, you stop the transmission. So, so it's a, a, a yeah, virtuous circle of, of disease control. Um, the second approach is through target-based screening uh, and then the discovery of a new a drug. And, and that you know, clearly is, is scientifically brilliant. And, and it, you know, one of the clear aims of AI and drug discovery is to increase the speed and time of the discovery and optimization of an initial hit through to a, um, a drug candidate. But, but in you know, all reality, that's going to be too slow for the current crisis. Maybe useful in the future, if we'd have followed on, if the community had followed on with, with very active SARS-1 research, um, yeah, hindsight's a wonderful thing, um, yeah, and we'd have had some small molecule drugs for that, we, we could have been in a far, a far better place, but, but we're not. And so the, the fallback position, uh, and, and really the focus of this today, is thinking about the reuse of an existing drug um, as the only realistic um, short-term option. And there's many workflows possible, yeah, it, it's, you know, again, it's, it, it's a wonderful time to, to be in this field. You've got the genome, you translate the genome, you come up with the proteins, you either determine the structure and, and uh, soak drugs in, or you can model um, the, the proteins and again, do docking and then move through to assays and clinical trials. Um, the, uh, or uh, another approach thinking about the, the, the virus host interaction side of things is to take infected cells, look for various host factors and downstream signaling pathways, analyze the network, select drugs for screening, again, test them in assays and through to clinical trials. Um, in, in my view though, um, you, you sit down, you know, any smart scientist and, and PubMed, um, and it's possible to come up with 
a believable, a, a superficially believable hypothesis for almost every drug to um, uh, COVID infection. Um, and, and this is, it, it's very easy to get fooled or, or um, you know, to find support for hypothesis from general mining of the, uh, of the literature. To give you an idea of, of how active the field is, um, you know, this is some data pulled back from uh, Corona Cancer, a resource that, um, that one of my collaborators and uh, wife at, at the ICR um, has developed. There's currently today 2,200 trials underway, uh, and that includes, includes the other uh, coronaviruses, SARS and MERS, um, 220 distinct drug interventions in that, and two efficacious drugs, so two approved drugs from that set that we know have some material um, impact on COVID-19 infection, remdesivir, dexamethasone. One viral, a direct acting antiviral, the other a host directed anti-inflammatory um, drug. There's a large number of um, uh, other potential um, uh, drug repurposing studies underway. Again, pretty good, um, uh, pretty good sort of hypothesis behind these. Um, so Arbidol uh, on the right hand side, omefenavir is, is, the, is the INN name of this drug. Um, so it's a Russian um, uh, or Soviet block, ex-Soviet block um, drug for influenza. Turns out that it targets um, uh, receptor binding uh, and there's a proposal uh, that it, it could potentially target this um, S protein, um, uh, S, uh, ACE2 uh, interaction. Um, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, more um, tenuous uh, data there. Uh, camastat, nefamastat, uh, some of the host factors at the top there. Um, lipinavir and darunavir um, are previously used um, uh, well, currently used um, uh, antiviral therapies targeting aspartic proteinases. Um, and you know, the literature's got many mentions um, uh, and suggestions that they also inhibit a, um, uh, a virally encoded um, protease, but, but there's no, on, on the basis of, of the trials that, that I've seen, that there's no evidence that, that actually there's any clinical impact. Um, and then um, this RNA-dependent polymerase um, as part of the replication machinery of the of the drug, of the, uh, of the virus. And we'll come back to that in, in some more detail. So, so the history of, 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 of my research has always really been um, yeah, putting together a data set, analyzing the data set and seeing how, um, how things go. So we, we um, pulled together a set of, of comprehensive antiviral therapies uh, for a number of reasons. Um, unlike cardiovascular drugs or, or neurological drugs, there's um, quite a big difference on diversity of anti-infective drugs approved in different countries around the world. So that I think there's three or four, um, you know, Russia um, uh, sort of uh, uh, specific drugs. There's some Japanese specific approvals um, uh, and so forth. So again, it, FDA approved therapies uh, and European approved therapies don't cover to any extent the, the worldwide uh, sort of arsenal of, of existing antivirals. Um, and I should have prefaced this with, with again, you know, the, the, it, it goes without saying, but the most obvious place to find an antiviral drug is to start with another antiviral drug, to sort of paraphrase um, the, the great late uh, uh, James Black. Um, the data set includes late stage clinical trial drugs, so phase 2b and, and, and 3. Um, and it covers all sorts of drugs as well. You know, we didn't want to just think about small molecules. There's antisense, there's a reasonably large number of antisense drugs in development, similarly for, for biological, cellularized receptors, monoclonal antibodies, and so forth. Immunoglobulin, so the, the purified plasma of um, people with other uh, viral diseases, um, turns out to be a pretty good um, antiviral um, uh, drug in, in some settings, and you've probably seen in the news, some of the reports of recovering the plasma of um, previously infected COVID patients to use in, in um, uh, uninfected uh, patients. Greater coverage than existing uh, online resources. Um, to be honest, I, I think the majority of the, the, the previous efforts that people have done in um, pulling together various drug compendia on, on, on the internet have to some extent neglected um, anti-infective uh, therapies. Um, you know, focusing on the human drugs, the relationship to the human genome, and so forth. 
Um, and you know, there's greater coverage that of, of this data set than classic literature reviews and, and so forth. So, so we've got 100, or just under 200 um, uh, drugs in total with 113 approved antiviral drugs to play with to think about um, repositioning. And of course, yeah, we, we collect approval status, chemical structures, um, whether the, the drug is a prodrug, the active form and so forth, depending on whether you want to, what particular, um, what particular um, uh, repurposing in silico strategy you're following. Nice example of a drug um, that uh, is, is relatively um, unknown um, in the West is phosphonavir. Um, it's a, a, a reverse HIV reverse transcriptase or a polymerase um, inhibitor. Um, and, you know, because you know, there's relatively little literature around it, it, it could be useful. It could be useful. The other interesting thing, um, so again, this comes straight from the data set, um, the, you know, there, there's a bit of a sort of dogma that there's less research going on in anti-infective areas than, than there used to be. So, but this is the number of um, uh, it's essentially late stage clinical trial entries judged by this um, assignment of a non-proprietary name over time. And you can see a clear upward trend um, between uh, you know, the, the mid 1950s and, uh, and the present day. So along the way, of course, there's been a sort of big cohort of drugs for HIV infection. Some of those themselves were repositioned from anti-cancer agents, effectively anti-cancer chemotypes that were found either to have direct action against HIV um, uh, and then were approved or were second generation agents thereof. Also great progress in, in um, treating HCV, hepatitis C virus. When I started my career um, at Pfizer, it was one of the, the um, interesting or untreated conditions we were working on. And if, you know, nowadays you, you look at the treatment of the disease and it, it's, you know, it's a completely different place to be. You know, it's effectively treated. If you've got access to the medicines, it's, uh, um, it's a great, uh, great approach. So maybe now some more interesting trends. Um, typically on the left-hand side, there'll be late stage and approved. And then on the right-hand side, uh, the approved route. The vast majority of historical antivirals were direct acting. So they targeted a process in the virus itself as opposed to the host. There are some exceptions to this. So Maraviroc is a, a CCR5 antagonist useful for the treatment of HIV infection. It blocks binding to the cell surface receptor but it is the exception rather than the rule. So you would expect that a repositioned um, uh, antiviral drug for COVID would be a direct acting antiviral as opposed to host directed. The dosage route, um, again, um, you would ideally want uh, an oral therapy. The majority, two thirds, are, um, two thirds are orally dosed and you could either use this as a hard or a soft filter on um, uh, your, your sort of computational screening or, or whatever, but it, it's it's unlikely that um, you know a topical drug could be you know repositioned for um, uh, for uh, COVID. Some drugs are um, dosed in topical and um, oral and parenteral and and so forth, but but um, a topical only drug, yeah, you know, it, it's difficult to see how that would that would cut the grade uh, with respect to, to a, a, a reasonable COVID uh, um, a drug. However, inhaled, getting to one of the primary infection sites in the body is a completely different matter. So even though inhaled is a sort of topical route, dosed to the epithelial cells, you know, the, the very fact that you've got a topical drug, you know, could be a, a really big um, uh, plus. The, this is now looking at the, the sort of target class, the vast or the largest class um, are uh, interfere with viral DNA or RNA processing uh, and replication. Um, there's clearly a set of protease inhibitors, probably most people are familiar with viral protease inhibitors, 17% um, of approved uh, are in that class, 8%, one in 10 almost um, are immunoglobulins. Um, there's a goofy and organic, you know, technically, um, I think it's zinc sulfide, uh, zinc um, uh, oxide, uh, it's certainly a zinc, uh, a zinc salt, but, but again, that's probably not the sort of thing that would be high up on, on many people's credible repositioning um, lists. Fair balance between um, protein targeting agents uh, and small molecules. 
so um, a, a significant recent trend for the development of, of uh, monoclonal antibodies, um, interference RNA type therapies as well. The other interesting thing to, to think about is where in the viral replication life cycle the repositioning event will, will most likely, or, or, or where the drug will be most, uh, drug activity will be most, um, most transferable. So there's, there's, I've just broken down the, uh, the viral life cycle into three stages here using the, the Wikipedia picture. You've got receptor binding and entry. That largely is species and family specific. Even within between MERS and SARS, there's a difference in the cell surface receptor. So one uses DPP4, I think, the other uses um, uh, ACE2. Um, so there's unlikely to be transferability of cell surface binding modulators because different viruses use different mechanisms to get inside cells. There's a largely common replication machinery, irrespective of whether the virus is RNA or, or DNA based. Of course, there's some technicalities there, um, but the replication is largely common to all viruses. There's a pinch point in terms of the, the system's biology and the way the virus can do its work. It needs replicating somehow, so it's got a touch, you know, the, the underlying genetic machinery of, of RNA or, or, or DNA. And then the maturation step, um, where you, you typically take a long polyprotein, these viruses are under huge pressure to have, typically under huge pressure, to have very simple genomes that require sort of unpacking and assembly. Um, again, that's a, um, a, a great intervention point. HIV protease inhibitors clearly work at, uh, at this step. Um, but uh, again, the specific protease families, the specific mechanisms tend to be unique or relatively family um, uh, specific. So taking all this data together, you come up with the relatively sort of trivial observation that if you looked at historical data, the most likely um, uh, repositioned uh, drug for COVID-19 will be a direct acting antiviral, uh, existing direct acting antiviral um, drug. It'll most likely target the DNA replication. And, and yeah, if you dig down to the actual target systems, it'll be a DNA or RNA polymerase inhibitor. Um, there are essentially no examples of cross-family, cross-clade um, uh, activity between in the maturation and the receptor binding and entry um, phases. Um, the, uh, and also the, the, the analysis would indicate that the, it's unlikely that um, a currently approved human drug will be active um, uh, directly against an antiviral, uh, against the virus. So you know, it's not saying never, um, but um, it, it's, uh, it, it's just unlikely. So the viral polymerases are the most precedented target in, in uh, the antiviral family. We, we know a lot about the structure biology. Again, a beautiful overview from this, um, uh, I think it's book chapter um, here. A common fold, common mechanism, a channel that the drug is loaded up into and, and does its, its business on the right-hand side, a sort of cross-section cartoon of, of how the drugs bind. But largely, well, I think exclusively, they are all pro-drugs. So if you try to dock the structure in PubChem or Kemble or whatever into the, drug, into the target, it, it shouldn't fit because you need to load it up with this triphosphate form. A lot of the, 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 the structures um, actually have a sort of uh, a semi-competent diphosphate um, form in the actual um, X-ray structure, but it's a non-trivial task to sort of build a model and then to realize, oh, uh, we need to, to actually um, you know, convert these into the, uh, into the active prodrug form. This is an example here. It's quite a complicated system. So this is a, a, an HIV drug, uh, lamivudine, um, also known as 3TC. First step is nucleotide kin a nucleoside kinase, then a monophosphate kinase, then a diphosphate kinase to produce the active form. The thing on the left-hand side is inactive. You have to have the machinery, and a cell-based assay uh, would, would have that machinery, or, or most likely to have uh, that machinery, in order to get the form that's um, active against the target. Um, if you have a recombinant enzyme, if you took the, um, the RNA, DNA, polymerase, whatever, and screened um, 3TC against it, no activity. And the other gotcha for thinking about drug discovery 
is that these compounds don't get into cells, that these nucleosides on average don't get into cells without some help from transporters. Um, so you have a, a family of specific transporters that pick up these nucleoside looking molecules because the body, the cell wants them for replication. Um, uh, and then uh, the transported inside to the cell. So it's, so it's again from a, a cell type um, and drug um, uh, screening perspective, it's quite a complicated system. Um, we know that the transporters on the surface of various cells in the body vary. Some cells have got different requirements for, um, uh, for, for nucleotides and so forth. Cells that aren't undergoing a lot of replication don't really need these transporters, I guess, once they're, they're made. Um, and across um, both drugs used for antivirals and for, um, and for uh, uh, anti-cancer therapy, nucleosides are a backbone of, of um, uh, cytotoxic um, anti-cancer therapies. There's, there's you know, quite well-defined uh, transporter specificity. So depending on the transporters present on the cell, the drug either may or may not get into the, uh, into the cell in the first place. The transformation, the second stage, the transformation of the initially absorbed drug into the triphosphate form, again, is cell dependent. You require having this three activation enzymes um, in the cell and capable of dealing with your drug as a, uh, as a substrate in order to get this, um, uh, this pharmacologically active um, triphosphate, uh, uh, triphosphate form. So it, it's a complicated thing. And, and again, from a computational perspective, it would be a wonderful method that could take um, uh, a, a nucleoside drug like this, enumerate it to the triphosphate form, understand and predict all the biotransformations required in a particular cell setting for a particular virus um, uh, to become uh, an active drug. And, and in reality, I, I don't think any any approach can do that. It, it would be an empirical approach. So remdesivir, yeah, this fits the pattern. It, it's a, it's an RNA directed, um, uh, an RNA directed RNA polymerase inhibitor. Um, so it, it's exactly interacting with the sort of machinery that's you know, the one highlighted by, um, uh, by the, the analysis of historical um, antiviral targets. The, it's actually a pro drug, a double pro drug. Um, so you can see. On the, on the right hand side, there's the structure. This um, phenol comes off and, and also this, um, this uh, ester, uh, amy, well, the ester amino acid, the alanine, uh, comes off to form the, tr the monophosphate, which is then um, uh, converted to the triphosphate form. So this, again, this won't dock into, the remdesivir itself will not dock into the target. It's a prodrug. Um, you know, all this gubbins on, on the left-hand side of the structure is irrelevant for the final sort of payload pharmacological um, activity. But, and the other interesting story, of course, many people know that remdesivir was originally developed as an Ebola um, agent um, as a response to the, the Ebola pandemic or potential global Ebola pandemic uh, several years ago. Um, it's active against Ebola in a whole bunch of assays didn't quite make it in, in clinical trials, but was then, you know, discovered to be active against um, SARS, the original SARS, and it became a clear candidate given the close relationship between SARS-1 and SARS-2, the causative agent of COVID-19 for repositioning. Um, but yeah, look at the picture on the right-hand side. It comes as an injected um, drug. And so this really, you know, it's, its use in a population setting is really limited. Um, it's IV infused as well, so it's not just a simple, you know, bend over and, and get a jab in the backside. Um, it's, you know, it, it's a more sophisticated and more labor intense um, dosing regime that probably, you know, as, as terminal limiting uh, and it's it sort of uh, use in an early, um, early setting. You, you've got to be in hospital or, you know, be pretty close to that to, to even dose the drug into, into patients. And of course, there's there's a lot of interest in coming up with different dosage forms, but fundamentally, yeah, that's baked into the, the physical chemical properties of the, of the optimized drug, which was to be used in an IV um, uh, setting. So um, the other incredible thing about this COVID-19 uh, sort of experience is, is just the speed of 
technology and in particular structural biology at um, understanding and uh, you know putting into a, a very rational basis the the you know the, the way these drugs actually work and and you know this is the, the on the left hand side is the original uh, paper um, from two years ago that shows that remdesivir it was then known as, as GS5734 was active against a number of coronaviruses of course COVID-19 virus SARS-2 wasn't known at the time um, but it just happens to because SARS-1 and SARS-2 this ortholog based repositioning sort of concept at the beginning you know this high chance of success yeah it, it just worked against it um, and and of course you yeah, know we can determine the structure of, of the the actual um, RNA polymerase from, from uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, and work out and see how the drug uh, binds and so forth. But a really, really interesting question if for me is, is remdesivir the optimal SARS-2 RNA polymerase? We've got, we've got validation from remdesivir that um, it's a clinically efficacious mechanism but if we can make improvements to the, the delivery uh, and the target engagement and so forth, yeah, that, is there a better remdesivir equivalent out there? It's really not suitable, as I've said, for community dosing or prophylaxis. Um, it's known that other um, uh, RNA polymerase inhibitors uh, work also against um, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so galadesivir, um, favipravir, uh, ribavirin, a really complicated drug, but, but it, it does almost everything um, with, with DNA uh, and a couple of early drugs as well. A lot of excitement around these uh, and so forth. But there's about 90 of these late stage, you know, nucleoside um, type or nucleoside class inhibitors. And, and, and really, what's the likelihood of that set of 90 sort of shots on goal that remdesivir is the optimal drug from this set and, and that's a, a you know a very active part of of our current research is you know from this this cloud of of drugs that we know or pretty certain will most likely work how do we get this cell entry this biotransformation to the loaded triphosphate form um, and activity against the target enzyme so a couple of a uh, couple of papers for further reading um, at the end um, just for a little bit of fun, long-term collaborator of mine, Tudor Apriya. Uh, we, we put together a, a, a sort of review a few years ago on um, some of the computational aspects of, of repositioning. Um, and I've already mentioned this uh, Parisi paper um, uh, uh, that uh, you know, gives a very good overview of both some of the, the strategic drivers for um, repositioning, but also a, a nice set of examples and, and a sort of ontology or classification of uh, a previous success. Acknowledgements uh, from the MDC, uh, Andre, Andrew, Anna, and Gemma, um, you know, great assistance in putting together the data sets when, when I was going blind or, or just completely lost uh, the will uh, to do things. You know, they, they came to the rescue with, um, uh, with, with uh, snapshots of the data. Um, Corona Cancer, a lovely resource. If you haven't seen this, check it out um, this afternoon. Uh, it's an um, uh, Institute of Cancer research um, sort of repositioning of a software system originally um, against, targeted against cancer uh, therapy, but trying to bring together um, data around the, um, uh, around, the, uh, uh, around the COVID situation. Again, you know, that's another like a meta theme in this repositioning, the repositioning of technology from one field uh, to another to address some um, pandemics. Um, the, the data, uh, you know, the, the data set I showed you is, is effectively inside uh, the Corona Cancer. Um, two um, previous group members of mine at, at the EBI uh, did a lot of the foundation work around viruses, viral receptors and so forth, Prudence, uh, now at GSK and Meg Garner, um, uh, an intern uh, and a long-term uh, collaborator, Tudor Apriya, probably known to many of you um, from uh, UNM. And with that, I'll, I'll come to an end.